All right, here we go. We are up and running with a new CPU uh, made by Hewlett Packard. <clears throat> if anybody's interested, um, and I am recording, so I think I'm going. You can you can see uh, we got it going on here. Hopefully, this will take care of my freezing problem. I'm looking at me right now. That's why my eyes are over here. Uh, oh, and there's the Virgin Mary has made it. Do you know? <laughs> some someone gave me that. Um, a, a, a student, a student's mother gave me that, because uh, she knew that I was Catholic, and um, it was very flattering because she had. Um, I I taught her son and. Uh, she was very grateful. And I have a set of rosary beads from her too. And if you if you don't know anything about Catholicism, those are icons or symbols of uh, the the Virgin Mary. Is, is uh, if you believe the way I do, is is the mother of, of Jesus, who is the Son of God, and, and that all that. And you know we can't talk about that anymore in school, but I do because I don't care. And uh, anyway, I I. Uh, this window over here, you see, with Domo on it, to keep the, I, I get on my knees every morning in that in that spot, and I can look straight out over to Sopras, and that's how I start my day, thinking about uh, how grateful I am for what the hell's going on in my life, and uh, it's a good way to start the day. You'll often see uh, if you read enough. I'm gonna make me small here. If if you read. Um, about what successful people are doing in their lives. Um, a lot of them do yoga. A lot of them do some sort of physical activity um, that ends up being uh, spiritual on some level. You know, I <laughs> I'm certainly not here to get you to to kiss pictures of the Pope. I uh, I've got my own. Ser the, the, the Catholic Church has some serious problems, and, and uh, I, I think it's quite corrupt. And, and as are most in large institutions like that, it, it, if you believe in the Tower of Babel that I've talked about, uh, you know, when things get big, they get corrupt. And, and I don't mean in, in, because everyone is evil. I mean because, and this is one of the reasons I want to get through to you, that I try my best, and it doesn't always work, to not attack people, not to do the ad hominem attack. Uh, ad hominem meaning Latin for the person. Ad hominem. Uh, I don't. I don't. I try not to attack the person. I try to attack the institution. You know, and the example, of course, is if you. The the ideas that my father always said: you go to church to say thank you to God for all the blessings that you've gotten. And I don't care if you're broke or where you are, you're alive and you're in a, a great country and, and all that. You can find, a, we're big on this in, in, in another organization I belong to, but make a grateful list and decide what you're grateful for and each day. And uh, But that's one reason you go. Um, but the, the idea that uh, institutions always have flaws because they're man-made. Uh, um, and these days, man and woman made, we you know, want to include you ladies in the flaws. Um, so <laughs> you can, uh, you know, you can uh, take part in the failure. You just don't get to, you know, because uh, you're a woman, you're not, you're not floating above us with a halo. So here's my CPU. It was at 100% yesterday when I tried to record. And now, uh, of course, I... I I added, I don't know, I just got a big machine. My, my son told me what to do, and I did it. And, uh, um, so um, there's a lot in the news. Keep reading. I'm, I'm going to move right to uh, not the Wall Street Journal, but I read something, and, and this goes to uh, freedom and, and taxation and some other things. But there's a, there's a usual the usual line that, that uh, the rich aren't being taxed enough and the, the poor are, 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 have all the tax burden and, and that's 
um, it's an interesting thought, I, you know, as, a, as someone who, oh, and I put a, <laughs> you know, the, the reason that this caught my eye uh, this morning as I was trying to study up enough to make a few moves in the marketplace and make us some money today, which I did, uh, is this. Look at, look at this. Look at, if you've never seen this, this is really cool. Um, this is called the National Debt Clock. It, uh, what's going on here? There I am. I think I'm working. Oh, okay. If you've never seen this, I, I think it's one of the coolest things I've, uh, I don't know who came up with this. Uh, let's see down here, U.S. Debt Clock. It's clearly these, the, whoever uh, pulled this together, um, it thinks like I do. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt if you're uh, a socialist. Um, you, you, here's the U.S. national debt at $26 trillion. Um, but remember, um, and rising, you see how fast it's moving? Uh, now, if you go down here, you can get to something called U.S. unfunded liabilities, and, and these are things like uh, these are things like uh, Social Security and, and yeah, money that's been guaranteed to people in the future. So they're unfunded liabilities. Here again, uh, when when as your education gets moving, I, I think one of the things that's so important to do is to take to take uh, to take accounting so you can make some sense of this. If you, if you don't know the basic accounting, accounting equation, assets equals liabilities plus owner's equity, and where where accounting came from, it's hard to have this discussion of, of what any of this means. Um, and look at you can scroll over things and it'll it'll tell you up top, what what is going on? Well, where am I? Oh, there's my hand. Uh, if if you scroll over federal U.S. federal tax revenue, it, it gives you a little thing on that Medicare Medicaid, right? U.S. total interest. All kinds of neat stuff here. Or uh, what was I doing the other day? Mortgage loan calculator, gold, precious metals. I was doing something about money supply or money creation, money and banking history. Look at this. You can click over to here and you can go, here's from 1100 to 1791, Tally Sticks, Bank of England. If you're curious about how money uh, was was came about, money didn't come about by government fiat. Money came about naturally. So... It's a good history of money. I give you a little history of banking. Uh, this this can be really handy if you want to get the high spots, uh, and and certainly and, and this this is uh, the way I think. And, and uh, the reason money is created is is largely because of this. Um, well, you know, wealth based, debt free, non interest bearing money. <laughs> okay, so that's a cool website, uh, but nonetheless, we're at twenty six trillion dollars in debt. Well. Abigail Downey, um, Disney, I'm sorry, Abigail Disney and some others believe that, uh, tax us, please tax us. Um, this is interesting. It's always interesting to me, raise taxes on people like us. That means, uh, when they say people like us, they're saying anybody, the first error that they're making is, is to say, well, uh, taxation is fair and people should volunteer for it. Not everyone does. So I, I read this immediately. I, I, you know, I don't get angry, but I'm like, I, I know Ben and Jerry's, you know, who went out of business. I don't, don't let your professors lie to you. Ben and Jerry's was bought by Unilever because they were actually losing a ton of money. Their, their socialist method of running a business didn't work. Now, they're good people. Ben is a great guy. Jerry's a great guy. Uh, it didn't work. Um, it should be noted that these uh, millionaires and billionaires, philanthropists, people are giving away tons of money. Jeff Bezos, not my favorite guy, donated $100 million to Feeding America. Um, but they believe that the way to fix this is to tax wealthy people. Um, it turns out 
that, that, that that's not altogether tr true and in my way of thinking um, charity is the way to do it uh, now I always go to the comments but and, and I commented here and I, that's what I want to show you just so you understand my thinking here um, but this fellow I don't know who it is Jack Tar I'm thoroughly sick and tired of this Robin Hood syndrome Robin Hood was a thief he stole from people that was the point of the of the play of, of the of the book. It was, uh, it, you know, it's not right to steal. Um, so taxation is theft in in the the way I think. It's incomprehensible that anyone who has a basic education in math can continue to buy this garbage. That you know, taxing the rich is going to take care of this national debt problem. National debt plus government mandated unfunded liabilities are 167 trillion. As you as you could see, uh, we only have on this thing. They say 153 trillion. Uh, I don't know how he does his numbers. I got uh, when I did it. I got 157 trillion. But yeah, what's a trillion here and there when you're uh, talking about these types of numbers? A trillion, by the way, is a thousand billion. Uh, if you believe. The cookbooks of the government publishers, I, don't, I know I don't. I can't even find an estimate of the combined state, city, and county taxes collected, except a significant number of states are insolvent. Uh, the estimated total financial wealth of 330 million Americans is $139 trillion. Wealth. We're not talking about money. We're talking about wealth. Houses. Cars. Um, businesses. You know, assets. Real assets. Uh, Nine, so new estimates the top 79 percent could contribute 95 trillion uh, that's not enough if you seized every penny of their assets if you, if you did a, a Soviet Union and stole everything from everyone uh, right if you believe in the in social in the socialist move if you believe that 261 million Americans should be penniless Welcome to Armageddon. Uh, he feels strongly about this. There's, and you can see people weigh in on this about taxing the rich. Taxing the rich is very popular. Um, it's, it's a very popular idea. Uh, here's how I checked in. Uh, this is a common error. What these people want is to ra raise taxes and socialize the economy even further, despite the historical data that where that leads is worse for the real poor people because it diminishes opportunity, right? I agree the right thing to do is if you feel you have more money than you need is to give it away to real charities or start one yourself or, or give it directly to people. Government inefficiency blocks people from having the spirit of helping. What I'm saying is because we write a check to Washington, D.C., there's a lot of cases where you, you, I mean, I don't want to be specific, but you know, you might see a problem somewhere and go, "Hey, there's a program for that. I don't, I don't need to roll up my sleeves." Um, rolling up your sleeve, roll up your sleeves, and get involved, like those of us who have been fortunate and like giving. Um, I, I, I can't tell you enough. If you don't volunteer or do something like that, it's very, very fulfilling. It, 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 you could have no money and give of your time and you, you'll feel better. It's, it is an anecdote to anxiety I, and, and that's one of the secrets of a, a recovery program like I'm in is service. You know, and uh, I'm lucky enough to serve at my church and some other places, um, volunteer, and it's just great. It's, it's fabulous. Bleeding heart leftist, sorry. I, there's a little, uh, it's not a good way to reach across <laughs> I was in a mood. Um, who want to force people to pay more taxes should divest. Give your money away. You have that option. And get in the trenches with those of us who understand that savings and production increase the size of the pie. This idea, this old, tired idea that, that there's a set amount of wealth out there is false. That's what you should learn from taking an economics course. It is false. We, the pie gets bigger when people save. When they put money into savings, that money gets loaned out and it causes production. 
Savings in production increased the size of the pie and has helped billions out of poverty so far. People are coming out of poverty very, very quickly. And I'm talking about gut-wrenching, dollar-a-day poverty in third-world countries. Read Steven Pinker's book. Um, I have no said what did I say here? Production increased the size of the pie and has helped billions out of poverty. Um, we know that savings and wealth drive growth. More government will lead to decay and inhumanity. This is not a theory. The evidence is clear from the murderous 20th century, uh, which is chronicled in the books behind me. Please leave us alone with your useless platitudes and wealth-destructive plans. Give your money away and help someone else if you want. Right? I'm not telling you what to do, uh, but I promise my freedom is more important than your ideology of stealing. I don't like to be stolen from. So keep your hand out of my pocket. Strong words? I don't know. Am I wrong? Uh, apparently so, because uh, there will be some sort of taxation. Uh, I assume they'll be coming after um, especially wealthy people um, and with uh, shitty results, I promise. It won't work. And you can watch it unfold. If, you, if, you're, if, you're, if you're sober and watching the data, you will understand that this is a bad idea. And, and I, I, that doesn't mean that, that Ms. Disney here, I mean, she's a wonderful lady. Give your money away. Go ahead. Uh, but if not, invest it in Disney stock. And believe me, Disney uh, hires a lot of people. Ben & Jerry's hires a lot of people. That's real wealth. Okay, now on to decision making. <laughs> I hope you like that story. Market Watch pissing me off this morning. The debt clock is really cool. Uh, a lot of information in there. Here's where we are. We're at. We're at. Uh, set, tomorrow is going to be 7:14. I'm going to put up. We're going to have three. One, two, three more um, discussions. God, you. I know you. You're doing a lot of writing, and and I. I really love your writing, so keep it up. Um, we're going to have a discussion on monopoly uh, and, and some of these terms that, that I'm not really very fond of. Um, product differentiation, differentiation, not one of them. Then we're going to talk about externalities, which, of course, is uh, um, and public goods, common resources, which will get you environmentalist crazed and you be throwing things at me. And then um, the economics of the welfare state, same idea. We'll have one more really cringy discussion, maybe on whether or not the welfare state has caused, done more harm than good. Um, and <laughs> I can see, just thinking about it, it's, it's, it I, lo I just love having that discussion because it's a discussion we should be having. So there's the last three weeks. I will put up the final... Uh, I, I will give you ample time to do the 80 question final that's all from the book. It's open book, open note, uh, and, and you, you should be able to complete it uh, qu quite quickly uh, and, and no problem. I'll put up a few more homeworks, uh, get through the homeworks. I, I did put quizzes up for a couple of them. And they're, they're quicker and easier. and I just want to get you through the book so you, you have some of the background and the mathematics involved in getting you to macro and then uh, your you know 300 level economics courses if, if that's what your desire is especially if you go to a mainstream college or university that has this weird uh, econometric bend to it uh, talk to mr. Lowry about that <laughs> anyhow uh, there's there's Glenn I was just listening to him to see if my stream would work Glenn Lowry, uh, economist at Brown University. If you haven't listened to him talk, um, especially with John McWhorter, uh, here's a good one, uh, debating Trump's intelligence. <laughs> Is he crazy? That's a good one. you got to listen to that. It's, it's very funny um, because they disagree in, in a fun way. Uh, so <laughs> it's good. All right, off to decision-making. Uh, here it is, chapter 9, yeah, 
what you'll learn here is uh, it, de making decisions. And I have two books in my hand. You've already seen them, um, but they, they, they're worth uh, selling again. Now, um, what, what I, I have a student that's coming here every day this summer, and uh, his name is Nick. And Nick uh, is my buddy, and he's, um, he's helped me paint the house and do some other things. But he just started this book in his headset while he's painting, and he, um, he borrowed from me Against the Gods by Bernstein, and I think I told you about Against the Gods, which is the story of risk. It's historical, it's psychological, and, and what I forgot and what he reminded me of is that in Dan uh, Kenneman's book here, Dan wrote it with um, another fellow who's dead now, uh, and and one. It, well, let me read you from from the from this the back of this book. Thinking fast and slow, uh, Dan Kenneman, the renowned psychologist. <laughs> psychologist. This is an econ course, and and winner of the Nobel Prize in Economics takes us on a groundbreaking tour of the mind and explains the two systems that drive the way we think. System one is, is fast, intuitive, and emotional. System two is slower, more deliberative, and more logical. The impact of overconfidence on corporate strategies and difficulties of predicting what will make us happy in the future, the profound effect of cognitive biases on everything from playing the stock market to planning our next vacation. Each of these can be understood only by judging how the two systems shape our judgment and decisions. This is, this is a book that will change your life. It will change the way you approach everything. Um, the same thing here with, with uh, Richard Thaler, another, another uh, uh, Nobel Prize winning economist. But uh, I, I talked to a student the other day and she said, I'm, I'm at the library getting Thaler's book. Um, to write a paper in another in, in another genre in another in another uh, uh, area of study, um, so uh, because it's apropos to psychology, so or or anyway, in here the, uh, it says Richard Thaler, Cass Sunstein, groundbreaking discussion how we can apply the new science of choice architecture. I wouldn't call it new. <laughs> Read against the gods uh, and nudge people towards decisions that will improve their lives. Every day we make decisions on topics ranging from personal investments. I just did that this morning. I do it with my dad. We try and keep our biases out of shit. It's not easy. Uh, unfortunately, we often choose poorly. Um, Nobel laureate Richard Thaler and legal scholar and best-selling author Cass Sunstein explain that being human, we are all susceptible to various biases that can lead us to blunder. Our mistakes make us poorer and less healthy. We often make bad decisions involving education, personal finance, health care, mortgages and credit cards, the family, and even the planet itself. In Nudge, Thaler and Sunseen invite us to, uh, to enter an alternative world, one that takes our humanness as a given. Right? Like a crazy hair. Right? We're human. This goes back to the first day of class. You know, are we always going to be human? Are we? Can we improve? Can we get better? Um, I would say some of us. We can learn. We can learn. Know thyself. Right? <laughs> you know, what, the, the reason I get on my knees in, and... and pray in the morning or, or meditate in, in the morning and evening is, is not to know myself. Not, not, it, it's also to, to pay homage to a, a, a mystery that I don't understand. But one of the other things is to, to get to know who I am and what makes me tick so I can apply this to my business life and my personal life. Because why not? Right? A, a, a life... A, a, a life that's that's unexamined and it's not worth living. Uh, so, part of why you go to college, you the elite, you are the elite, 
um, regardless of you know, say, well, I'm in a community college, how good? It's bullshit. You've got enough going on that you're here. And, and something's going on that you're taking a 200 level course in economics. Uh, that means that you're probably going to be managing something. So it's a good idea to know yourself and maybe know a little bit about others through psychology. And if you're like me, uh, in my 20s, I was not that great of an employer. Uh, I'd like to think I'm pretty good now, but uh, the jury's out. Okay, I'm going to put me in the corner and go on with what you will learn here. Why does good decision making? Now, Krugman's going to take some of this. Um, I'm not sure how accepting he is. He and Ms. Well, Dr. Wells uh, are of, of all of it. But um, again, I'm trying to make your experience a little more robust than maybe the average bear or professor. So what's the difference between explicit and implicit costs? Very basic. Uh, what's the difference between accounting profit and economic profit? Nothing. Uh, why is economic profit the correct basis for decisions? Uh, economic and, and, and uh, they, they should be the same. I don't know why there was a, uh, a, um, a, a fork in the road for these two areas of study, e e uh, economics and accounting. There shouldn't have been, in my opinion. Um, money's money. Decisions are decisions. Okay. Uh, why are decisions involving time difference? Time value of money. We've got an appendix on this chapter. Um, this is net present value and why you should understand this. It has very much to do with the interest rate, which we've touched on over and over. Um, that's why manipulating the interest rate and, and affecting people's time preference through fooling around with the price of money, right? The, the whole idea behind the Keynesian, um, the, the Keynesian method in government is get people to spend now. We want a nation full of grasshoppers, um, not ants. And if you don't, haven't read Aesop's Fables, The Ant and the Grasshopper is what I'm talking about. Read it. It takes two minutes. Um, I am the ant. I'm saving for my children's future. I'm saving so that maybe they'll have a better life than I have. People that get in the trunk of a car and go across the desert in Arizona get to this country are ants. They're making a decision, a decision to leave a country that's a socialist country where things aren't going well and come here for opportunity. Not so they can do better, so their children can do better. That's a decision involving time, right? So... Onward, cost and benefits. Quality of our decisions depend on how well we understand costs and benefits. You know, the main thing here is, if, if you're, especially if you're a business person and, or you're in a managerial position in a, com a company, do you have a process of making decisions? Do you and your wife have a process of making decisions? You know, like, should we put windows in the house? Should we put doors on a house that we're selling. We just put sliding glass doors in. We had a long discussion on that. This is a sunk cost. I'm going to show you why in a second. Decision whether you continue in school or leave and find a job. I've talked with more students. I've talked a number of students out of get doing this, you know, spending money doing this when they had an opportunity to do something else. I had a, a, a a great example last semester of a young man who was in uh, Accounting 122 and he got an opportunity to sell insurance. Bilingual, uh, uh, you know, second generation dude. I was like, dude, you're going to kill it in this valley. You're going to sell insurance to every Mexican and Latino entrepreneur from rifle to here. You're going to just do really well. I said, you can't afford to be sitting in this classroom, listen to me, drone on about accounting. You can take accounting and, and you, you, uh, online. You can take it, you know, uh, 10 years from now. You can, uh, whatever, I, you know, uh, but I just felt he needed to be the first mover in that area because there's 10 other uh, Latino guys that are thinking the same thing, you know, so get after it. Um, why do you stay? Why would you stay in school in that in that situation? Why did I think they're going to use this example? You know, 
why would uh, what's his face Facebook guy Zuckerberg stay at that's how we started the course with Zuckerberg why would you stay in college you know you just built this piece of software that nobody else had got lucky so Harvard screw it I'm having iced coffee so sorry <laughs> be careful and <laughs> I can't be responsible after the cup is gone. An explicit cost is, is a cost that requires an outlay of money, right? Tuition. Um, that's explicit. Implicit does not require an outlay of money. Right? This, this is wages foregone. It's the opportunity cost, right? Wages foregone because of being a full-time student. That's, that's what uh, uh, this young man was giving up because he was sitting in class. He should have been out selling, uh, and he's good at it. Um, so, uh, in a means to an end, you know, I came back to school because I thought, well, I wanted to learn. I, I, I wasn't worried about income uh, so much anymore. Uh, I still am, but not, not as much as I used to be. And, and also... Uh, I thought that my resume was getting tossed aside because I didn't have the, the bachelor's. Uh, there's a certain uh, level of licensure involved in, in getting a degree. That's why there's people sitting in chairs right now listening to this who are basically checking a box. They, they're not, you know, they're not in for the love of learning. They're, they're just going, I have to have the bachelor's to get to where I want to get. I get it. I get it. I, I think. You know, I, I wish it was easier to get. Accounting profit, uh, revenue minus explicit cost. I mean, real cost. That's what they would call them. Econo and economic profit uh, adds these implicit costs in. I would argue that th this is the same. You know, there's no reason to, there's no reason to uh, differentiate between the two. But we do, and you need to know that. So uh, that's the gospel according to... Uh, Keynesian economics. Economic profit equals revenue minus the opportunity cost of all resources used. This is the type, this is when you when you get to strategic management at the end of your at capstone, uh, your, capstone meaning your, your terminal course in, in your bachelor's at 400 level, um, your, your capstone course, you, you'll be doing strategic management. So you're bringing all this information together. That, that means that you'll be, you'll always even if you're an accountant, you're going to bring, you're going to you're going to take into consideration the difference between a bookkeeper, an accountant, and a CFO is the ability to put everything together. Does that make sense? The ability to put the whole picture together is why CFOs get all the money. That's what that's all. It's it's your ability to think critically and put these things together that they're trying to teach you the building blocks of it in a 200 level course. Usually, and, and if you're able to do that, if you have the G, the IQ to do that, you're going to you're going to succeed. Usually less than accounting profit, of course, because, you, you know, foregone uh, minus the opportunity cost of, of other resources. It shows a more complete picture of costs. And, and we're going to get into that in the next chapter. Helps businesses and individuals make better informed decision. It's the measure that economists prefer should be the measure that accountants prefer. Okay, they, everybody prefers that who's running a business, um, and and this is one of the reasons that that uh, government fails is they don't do an accurate accounting of all the uh, costs and benefits of their uh, of a policy. They they just sell it for votes, and they don't they don't look at long you know long run costs and benefits and unintended consequences and things like that. So we write all this down, and then I, and I'm going to pick on Dr. Krugman and, and Dr. Wells, uh, because Dr. Wells is, a, speaking of women, uh, and women, she is, is as much of a writer of his column as he is. The way I understand, they are a team, and, and as much as I've been able to get to know them, so don't discount Dr. Wells if you read an article by Krugman and you think it's fabulous. Remember, she is uh, she is the ghostwriter on that team, and uh, and and very outspoken, and has taught him. Uh, I think she's the one that's the more of the cutthroat of the team. 
uh, from what I understand. And he has said that himself in interviews. So I'm not just talking out of turn here. Um, okay, zero profits. Uh, this is the lion tamer. Uh, if you quit your job as a lion tamer. Now, I already gave this lecture before. I'm 35 minutes in. I gave this lecture before my computer just sort of gave up the ghost. And I started talking about the lion tamer, and I was laughing about it. And I'm, I'm sorry I deleted all that. But uh, if you quit and, and, and open a tanning studio, what is your economic profit? We would say it's zero. You're earning just enough to cover your cost, including the foregone lion taming wages. Uh, you're doing just as well in your new job as your old one. If you hadn't considered your implicit, implicit cost, your analysis would suffer, right? Uh, those are your uh, in, implicit costs. They're trying to, but what they what they forget here <laughs> is it, it's deeply psychological. And, and back to Kenneman, lion tamer is really dangerous. <laughs> Tanning studio sounds a lot less dangerous. So how do you parse that? This is where where uh, this type of economics falls apart because. Yeah, I quit my job. as I, I would take a pay cut to go to the tanning studio because I might be less apt to do a Siegfried and Roy. And, and uh, those of you who don't know them, they were a couple of guys that, that had a, a magic show in Vegas and they would make tigers disappear. They loved tigers. These two gentlemen, they were married and they, they loved tigers and, and that and they raised them and shit. Well, one day he got... I don't know, something happened with one of the tigers and chewed one of them up really bad. Uh, and, and it was awful. And I, oh, I watched the video. It was really hard to watch. But that's what being a lion tamer is all about. Shit. So you might, you might put a cost on, what do you want to call it? The risk. And this is back to Kenneman or, or uh, um, oh, God. Against the gods, you know, the, the, the history of risk. It, what is risk worth? There's a value to it. So this, when I get to this uh, slide, always, and each time I look at this slide, I, I think about it a little more deeply. You know, <laughs> the, the funny thing about being a professor is, is that each time you teach a course, you teach it just a little bit differently according to the reading that I've done, the, the, the things that happened to me personally, the, the, the course is never the same. So, you know, I've, I've met students that I had six or seven years ago, and I, I see them in the street, and they, you know, I should almost say, uh, I'm sorry that you didn't get the deluxe cleaver <laughs> with all the, you know, the, the continuing education, because I'm up here just like you, learning how I think, you know, and, and any professor, you know, that's why, uh, you know, passing off teaching a course like this to um, a grad student may not be a good plan. You know, if you were at Harvard, um, well, at Yale, you know, uh, uh, once you get up to the 300 level, you, you're, you've got the really good profs, and, and I, I don't mean that in a denigrating way because there's probably a lot of good profs who are grad students. Uh, in, but nonetheless, you get what I mean. You just get this experience of me teaching this over and over. It, so people say, doesn't it get dull going through the same book? I said, I, I, especially in economics, I would say not at all. Law, when I teach law, holy shit, you know, it's ever changing. Um, even accounting, I... I get deeper and deeper into that subject. So I'm thinking on my feet. I'm talking on my feet. Uh, and, and each time I look at zero profits, I go, oh, yeah, well, fear, tanning studio. Well, what's, the, you know, how bad are UV rays? I, I don't know. Uh, but if you're just out at the desk, you're not getting the rays. But you're, you're, you're also opening your up, yourself up to a liability you know, can somebody come back and sue you for cancer because they spent too much time in a tanning booth? Uh, this is great. Ann Crittenden. Mm. I'm not sure you know. Um, and this goes directly to the discussion 
uh, and, and we can stop for a second and talk about the, the wage gap, but most of the wage gap in, in between men and women is, is explained away by this phenomenon of, of women leaving the workforce. Uh, and, and if you, you, you know, maybe we'll have, maybe, maybe we'll talk about that before the end of the semester. Um, because <laughs> there's some great, this has been studied for a long, long time, and, and anyone who, who has done any worthwhile, uh, any sober and, and careful look at why, you know, it's 79 cents a dollar or whatever, you know, whatever the politicians want to tell you is wrong um, about the, the pay gap. The, the price of motherhood is a serious price, but one that anybody who, who has kids know that it's well worth paying. But in this particular case, Ann Crittenden claims the cost uh, for a college-educated couple to have a child is a million bucks. Now, notice, notice this caveat: a college-educated couple. Um, that's a that's a whole separate genre. That's that's you, and uh, and whoever you marry, because college-educated people tend to marry college-educated. They get married for one. You know, there's a, there's a marriage gap in this country that's ever widening, which we can talk about. It's as part of the uh, uh, part of the problem with with uh, the African American community, I, this is what Lowry and, and other scholars are talking about as as being ignored, uh, largely ignored in this discussion. But even in in the white community, it's it's forty percent unwed uh, uh, single parent households. So we're talking about college educated couple. I assume they mean married. Uh, it's a million bucks. Um, because you give up unearned Social Security credits, um, if 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 the women stays a woman stays home or the man, they, they're going to give up promotions. Uh, my my brother-in-law stayed home while my sister Sue climbed the ladder in banking, and uh, uh, he gave up his career. He done, he's, you know he started out as a as a teacher at a prep school, and he was he was coaching uh, uh, lacrosse and. Nobody will hire him now. He's done. Uh, salary lost by not working. Nobody's going to hire him back at 56 years old. Uh, baby's room. Lost experience at work. If you leave, especially in a, a highly technical field, if you leave for even a year, uh, you know, you're behind. You're behind. Uh, that's why when, when Tom Sowell looked into the wage gap, he used... He used uh, very specific figures from the Census Bureau. You, when you look at um, single women, you you know, and compare what they make at similar jobs. Well, you can't just look at at uh, single women. You have to look at never married to really do the correct comparison. And it turns out that women who are never married make more. They actually make more, and especially in, in uh, highly technical fields, they tend to out-earn the men. Um, so uh, there's, there's a serious problem with, you know, with women. And, and, and I, believe me, ladies, I, I, my hat is off. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have to make that decision. Um, I, I think anybody who knows it knows children, if you have kids and you're listening to me, um, go into this cringy thing. The uh, men suck at raising kids from early to you know from baby to about three years old. Uh, you know damn well you don't want to leave me alone with Alice. It's a shit show. We're yeah the BB guns are coming out. Um, so there's there's some biological factors to that, and men and women are different in a good way. Um, but anyway, we can talk some more about that. <laughs> Loss of pension, uh, wards and kudos, babysitting, preschool. Uh, you know, so these are all, this is a great discussion, man. If we were in the classroom, we could kick it around and I could really piss you off. Um, lost training, uh, cost of decorating the kid's room. But, you know, basically, kids are really expensive. So why do people have kids? Why? Because it leads to a fulfilling life? You know that's what we're here for. I, I, no one says that anymore. You know when we when we talk about the there was an idea that was kicked around in the in the 60s and 70s and 80s that that 
you know, a single parenthood was good. That, that there's a raft of, of uh, literature from the psychological uh, journals that's that's coming in that's saying that is a really bad idea. And the lack of fatherhood was it was a terrible idea, and, and we're going to go on to the welfare state. And and when I start talking about the welfare state, I, I go incentivizing uh, broken families was a really really bad idea, and and we were reaping what we sowed in the in the uh, great society and Lyndon Johnson and uh, I'm not going to blame it all on him but it's uh, <clears throat> that those ideas that came around uh, in 1964 um, we were going to go to war on poverty and we did and we spent trillions of dollars and uh, what we've got is uh, a, a bad situation in, in my estimation and of course you can disagree and Show me the evidence that I'm wrong. Um, so there you go. Uh, that, that's, that's, you know, should we have kids? Uh, in my way of thinking, and this will blow your mind, you don't have a choice. <laughs> your job, my job, is, you know, if you, if you come from my background, you get married and have children. That's what you do, you know. And, and uh, it, it, I'm glad that I was sort of brought up that way and, and, uh, because it's been the most amazing thing in my life, you know. And uh, uh, I think that that uh, the mystery that I call God is is um, uh, very benevolent to people who who uh, don't have that miracle of children in their lives, and they get to do other things and and help people in different ways. But yeah, if if you're on uh, if, if you have kids, that's your job. You know, my my primary job is to teach them. I love teaching you, but uh, my my primary job is behind me, sitting there watching weird YouTubes. Uh, and she's um, my job is to get her off the launch pad, uh, along with with Kelly and I together doing that because I do a shitty job alone. There's a yin and a yang to that. Uh, so uh, implicit, except what? Paying rent on an existing building, implicit interest that could have been earned. And I noticed the, the noticed the verbiage uh, from a savings account if that money were not used, right? So that's a mm, that's a great example. If you decide to start a business, it should return more than what than than what you put in the savings account. So let me give you a quick example. Um, uh, foregone, and it's C and D you could read here, but let's say you say to me, I'm going to buy a boat and a pickup truck and some fishing tackle, and I'm going to start, um, you know, Joe's fishing guide. And I'm like, okay, uh, what do you expect your return to be on your capital? Right? So let's say you put, uh, you know, $40,000 into a truck, another 10,000 into a float boat, uh, one of them in, in a trailer. Uh, let's say all in, you've got uh, $75,000 and interest rates are at uh, 1%. What would your return be on that 75,000? Well, it would be uh, $750 a year. Are you going to make more than that? Because if you're not going to make more than $750 a year, you should just put the money into a CD and, and collect that money, right? Um, maybe here's a better example. I, I know a guy who, who owns an auto parts store, and he's a, he's a good friend. Um, we we um, share an interest in this little Catholic school, and, and his daughters are graduating now, but he, he's just a great guy, and he and his wife are great people. Um, but anyhow, he said to me, well, you know, I, I need to get involved in the stock market and, and uh, make some more money. And I said, listen, slick, <laughs> what shoemaker stick to thy last? What sort of return are you getting from selling auto parts? And he said, well, that, you know, the, 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 he's got a couple of stores. Uh, this store returns me uh, 8% and this one's at 10%. And I said to him, then if, if you give me your me all of your money and I put it in the stock market, if I don't lose it, okay, the mean of the average mean going back to 1893, that's far back as I, is about 6.8%, right? 
right? Um, before inflation. Okay, 6.8% is maybe the return I can get you investing in, in a portfolio of equities. Now, chances are I would mix it with bonds. They only return 4.4% uh, over time. So you might get you might get an average of five and a half percent, six percent. If you're selling auto parts and you're making eight percent, what should you do? Well, you should sell auto parts. Gee, that that's a no-brainer, right? So these are these are decisions, right? Now, what what he was thinking was, oh well, um, I can I can. Uh, go in the stock market and I'll make money quick right this this is why this guy wrote this book I you know get rich quick scheme it's like no don't do that you're making an error you're making a type one error uh, because the chances are if I don't lose your money I'm not gonna make that much okay so paying uh, uh, all of the following are considered implicit yes this is explicit paying the rent on the existing building right because all these other ones are are implicit costs sandy owns a firm annual revenue of a million wages rent another nine hundred thousand suppose that instead of being an entrepreneur sandy could get a job uh with two hundred fifty thousand right so the difference between nine hundred uh and a million is a hundred thousand we subtract that from 250 and we get 150. uh calc that would be his economic profit, right? Um, right? Did I do that right? I think so. Um, yeah. So, uh, his his economic profit would be minus one fifty. So, uh, you would go do this, right? But um, assume that a job would be as satisfying. See, th see this assumption. This is the assumption that makes. An Austrian crazy, an, an Austrian economist, uh, economist crazy because it completely devalues something called fulfillment. It devalues uh, the, the the human choice um, because I I took an enormous pay cut to be uh, to to own a dairy farm because it it gave me something that. You, you could it was the value proposition it, it, it was that conundrum of, of the value proposition because the value of my own farm was that if my socks got wet I got to go inside and take a nap because I own the goddamn thing now I don't know how to value that but it certainly isn't a hundred thousand dollars a year it's a lot more if if you know I got to do you know, if, if if I wanted to shoot a deer, I shot a deer. If I wanted to, uh, you, you know what I mean? I, there was something about owning your own property and, and, and having your own little fiefdom, if you will, that's intangible. Um, so if you offered me the job for 250 back when I first started farming, I would be like, oh, my God, <laughs> maybe I should go do that. But, as you know, the benefits began to outweigh the costs in, in a in an intangible fashion. So cost of capital, capital is a total value of assets owned by an individual or firm. Physical assets plus financial assets. So it's the truck and, and the float boat and the rods and reels uh, plus whatever financial assets you got, uh, which might be $100,000 in the bank that you saved up for the COVID virus because that's what you're supposed to do. Um, or what have you, you know, stocks, bonds. Uh, the implicit cost of capital is the opportunity cost of the use of one's own capital. I just explained this. That is the income earned if the capital had not been em employed in its next best alternative use. Uh, E.g. foregone interest income, of course. So, you know, should we, should we add another store or just put the money in the bank. Well, if um, if the Federal Reserve is going to step on interest rates and keep them at zero for 20 years, uh, what are you going to do? Uh, that's why um, setting the price of money, uh, setting interest rates, is a really, really bad idea and should be illegal. And it is illegal. They just don't prosecute it. 
Uh, there are two types of decisions. Now here we are getting into decision making uh, per se, uh, for real now. Choice between two alternatives is an either or decision. Um, more complex choice that requires us to choose at the margin how much, right? Should I go to college is the either or. Uh, it would, you know, should I go to college or go sell uh, um, insurance? Or should I take an extra class? You know, uh, is, is, is 15 credits enough or should I take 18 credits? You know, I'm constantly, you know, I'm bombarded with this question. If, if I'm your advisor and you say, uh, gee, uh, you know, on the margin, should I take um, econ uh, and, and, and then take uh, calculus and take stats and take accounting too, all in the same semester? <laughs> I'd be like, that seems like a little much to me. Uh, you're a smart uh, gal or guy, and, and uh, you probably get away with it, but you're going to be busting your ass. You know, so uh, that's decision on the margin. Uh, the, the, the other one is, is much easier, should I go or not. Um, principle of either or, when faced with an either or between the two activities, all else being equal, of course, this is a problem. Choose the one with a positive uh, economic profit. Economic profit, you know, and, and uh, again, we always think in terms of this. Um, 2009, average value of an acre of farmland in the United States was 2100. Rhode Island, it was 15,300. Tons of incentive to sell, right? Why would you sell? You know, this is a, a either or type of decision. Uh, what if, what if instead of, what did I do? Here, yeah, either or, right? Uh, what if instead of just two options or three or more, does the principle of either or still apply? Yes. Any choice with more options can always be boiled down to a series of choices. You just, you, you know, you, you, you go, okay, this or that. Okay, this or that. Um, and it makes sense. Buy or rent. Uh, you know, uh, um, I talked I, I've talked with several professors who said well um, myself and my husband uh, one, one woman in particular said we, we bought this house in Carbondale for you know twenty five thousand dollars now it's worth four hundred do you think we should sell you know, I mean you know that's a screaming sell you know that uh, you have to <laughs> you've got to put that money to work it'll pay your rent somewhere else you know things like that. Um, but you don't see those things clearly. That's why uh, Nudge is what, is what it's about, and, and that's why those books are so interesting. What if instead of just two options, yes, we covered that, uh, to make good how much decisions require weighing additional costs and benefits, marginal cost, uh, you know, how much does it cost to make one more doll if you're... Uh, I, can't, I don't even know what kind of dolls they're making these days. It used to be Cabbage Patch dolls. Um, there's a limit, and this is why, uh, if you, hopefully you're listening to Murray Rothbard, you, you, we talk about total revenue, you know, to, and we're going to talk about costs in the supply. Um, marginal cost curve shows how the cost of producing one more unit depends on the quantity that has already been produced. Am I out of the picture here? There we go. Better. Um, increasing marginal cost each each uh, additional unit costs more to produce than the previous one. Constant marginal cost. Uh, each each one costs the same to produce as the previous one. Well, you know, you're, you know, as you, you hire another shift, maybe you get better people. You may you do some training. There's all kinds of variables here, uh, but but it's you know this is a blunt instrument. Each additional cost uh, uh, unit costs less to produce than the previous one. Uh, yeah, there's some economies of scale. But as I said, those go away, and uh, they go away pretty quickly, um, depending on the business. Now, I'm in the way here. Let's go there. There's Miss Alice. <laughs> you freak. <laughs> each, year, each year of schooling costs more than the previous year. As a result, Alexa has increasing marginal costs, and, and here's the curve. Uh, you know, this, this isn't, you should do this. Just they go, okay. How much more money am I going to make with the MBA? How much more am I going to make, uh, you know, with just the BS, the Bachelor of Science or the Bachelor of Arts, which, whichever. 
right? And then, you know, what are, what are the uh, intangibles? You know, I, I love Shakespeare. Um, I know I always mention, I mention course after course after course and students and book after book after book and students say to me, who has time for all this? And, and I, I, I keep saying you have a lifetime, you, you know, just make a commitment um, to say, all right, I, I'm going to, I'm going to listen to all of uh, Jordan Peterson's lectures on maps of meaning um, because I'm interested in comparative religion. You don't have to, you know, make it part of your uh, your Bachelor of Science this time around. Uh, you can always add to it, and you can always walk into a a, a, uh, a situation where you're being interviewed and say, "Hey, by the way, um, I, my degree's not in finance, but I listened to all of all of the lectures on uh, an MIT course in finance over the summer, and I understand net present value, and and I know how." Uh, the banking system works because uh, that idiot Cleaver told me. And you know, make sure you sell yourself that way. And and you know, if you're if you're mowing the lawn, listening to death metal, you know, once in a while, okay. But uh, maybe you should try something else. Uh, you know, and and uh, Shakespeare, great idea. Um, okay, marginal cost, right? Graphing it. This, so this is what it ends up being. Uh, quantity of school and years, marginal cost per year. So total versus marginal, it, it, it can be easy to conclude that marginal cost and total cost must always move in the same direction. But if the marginal cost of producing the first widget is five bucks, the second four, the third three, the total cost rises as marginal cost falls. Does that make sense? Right? You know, this is, uh, uh, think of Starbucks, right? You know, if you're only selling one cu cup of coffee, it's five bucks, right? But we can really move them out the door. The, the, the way when, when, if anybody who's worked in hospitality uh, or um, had known like, oh my God, we were in the weeds today. Well, if you're running that business, you want to be in the weeds all the time because that's when your marginal cost is the lowest. When you have people working, being really productive, you know, and you know who those people are. They're really productive waitresses uh, or waiters, and they're just really good when, when the shit's hitting the fan and there's all these tables and, and uh, you know, you, 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 they're just good. They don't – my wife Kelly is like that. She, If you're looking for a spouse, um, and, and men are like this too, watch them clean their house. And, and watch them, and and, and lady, if, if the guy's not neat, run the other way. Um, if, but she, she's really bright anyway. But but she has this. Uh, my mother was like this too. She didn't waste movement, right? And 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 you know this when you go into a restaurant and you run into a server. Um, can't call them waiters and waitresses anymore. Sorry. Uh, a server who, who they don't forget shit. They 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 remember all of it, and they they just and and they're in a fluid motion. They're coming by your table on their way to another table on their way to another table with all the correct stuff either in their apron or in their hands. So they 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 don't they're just good. <laughs> Those are the people you want. They're awesome, uh, and. and if you watch people, you'll you'll notice that gift, and it's a it's a good gift to have. <laughs> Organizational skills, a lot of it has to do with IQ. Marginal benefit, the additional benefit derived from producing one more unit of good or service, and you run out of people that are that good, which is that that's the nightmare of hiring. There's a decreasing marginal benefit from an activity when each additional unit of activity yields less benefit. So. We have this marginal benefit curve. You know, they're trying to put everything into curves so they can talk you into some math. And uh, you're going to see this in the homework. So look at the benefit of school, right? You know, you get that that uh, uh, marginal benefit of three hundred thousand dollars from a year. You know, uh, that's why PhDs bitch so much. You know, because they don't get paid. Some do. They're just really smart. But there's a group of PhDs, 
most of them in education. You know, I got a doctorate. And I'm like, yeah, but you didn't really. You're just mad. Um, because you're not getting paid what you think you ought to be. And, and sh losers like me get paid a lot. <laughs> but that's that's the way the world works. Um, uh, Alexis marginal benefits the curve connecting the midpoints at the top of each bar. Yeah, they're just trying to teach you how to do this math. Um, and, and when you get to calculus, you'll really get a feel for some of this. Um, marginal analysis, optimal quantity, right? We're, we're not talking about... Um, marginal revenue, we're talking about total revenue, right? Price times quantity equals total revenue. That's what we want to know, and this is what's useful if you're in business. Profit maximizing principle of margin analysis, right? Should we make 100,000 more widgets? No, we shouldn't because it's not going to make us more money. Uh, we make more money at this level of production unless we put up a new plant. You know, th this is the Tesla thing, you know. Uh, if you if if you know anybody who's into um, uh, producing manufacturing, um, it's very interesting this kind of study, and you'll get to do it. Uh, um, the the simulator at the end of your career here at at CMC, the sim that you do, will will do that. You'll think, okay, we're gonna make this many shoes. It was a shoe simulation. We're going to make this many shoes, and, and you find out, well, you don't have the capacity to do that. But not only that, your total revenue is down. You go, shit, how did that happen? I, we sold everything we had. Uh, but it's not always that simple, and this is what, we're, what's why we learn this. Marginal benefit and marginal cost intersects the max, the, at the maximum total profit. And this is right from your homework. Uh, so uh, you'll be able to see exactly how this works. And... Um, or doesn't work all the time. It 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 it's just a tool. It's a, another tool in your kit. Uh, you know, again, when when you uh, graph this, you go to the meeting and you go, "Here's what I came up with. Here's where I think we can be." And then, if you have a team, uh, hopefully, uh, men and women and, and 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 people who think differently, then they all go, "Well, uh, you know, let's shoot for this because it'll push." Uh, our productivity of labor and our productivity of our machinery and a little further and I think we can sell it if we incentivize our sales staff the right way and da, da, da. you start to you start to do some strategic management which is what this is all about um, how long you plan to spend studying <laughs> you guys are gonna study nobody studies anymore um, uh, if, if, now, the funny thing about, you know, my diatribe against um, studying and, and learning and all these things about how this is all changing, the problem is we're still stuck in this situation where you better get something out of this course because the exam is going to be something like the CPA or your Series 7 or Series 63 if you decide to go into finance, if you go... Uh, on to graduate school, you're going to have to take the GRE, or you may take the MCAT if you're interested in, in med medicine or veterinary medicine. So, uh, sorry, you better pay attention, uh, and I'm not going to hold your hand. I, I don't uh, abide by the administration's effort to make sure that you're doing every bit of homework all the time. I could give a shit. Um, your, your learning is up to you. Luckily, the price is right. Aren't we, uh, the, here's the pitfalls, <laughs> aren't we trying to maximize the difference between benefits and costs? Yes. Um, but what we're doing here is setting marginal, not total benefit to cost equal to each other. You know, so uh, <laughs> that's a big pitfall, as you can see. That's why this is subjective, not objective, right? Subjective, um, a lot of it, you know, um, the, in just to recap, I'm five foot nine inches tall. That's objective. You can measure it. Subjective is I'm attractive. Um, that's beauty's in the eye of the beholder. So off we go. I'm gonna move me again. Oh, oh move you, move me. Okay, so larger homes. 
it, this is interesting how sizes around the world. Turns out it has uh, uh, lower prices of land, have everything to do with it, um, but also relative income. You know, we, why is our, we, but in our, in our case, in the United States, why, why, why are these houses, why did they get so big in 2008? And this is a structural change. I think uh, a lot of young people are not going to buy these big houses. What the hell for? They'd rather travel and do other things. Um, I got 4,800 square feet here um, for three people. It's kind of silly. Uh, we love it. We're glad to have it. We'll, I'm sure we'll miss it uh, when, when we move on. But nonetheless, uh, why did that happen? Um, I, an Austrian economist would always argue that that's a function of low interest rates. When you lower interest rates, you get what's called malinvestment. So people, that not only do they buy things they can't afford, they build things that they, that are too big. They, they, you know, my father always said, uh, buy what you need, not what you want. And uh, I've been pretty good there. Uh, but we paid cash, so I didn't, uh, it, it didn't. It, it, it was a good investment, I think. Um, okay, sunk cost. This is so important. Uh, everybody makes this error. Uh, and this is a thinking fast and slow. Dan, Dan Kenneman covers this, and, and so does uh, Nudge uh, Thaler. Sunk co cost has already been incurred and is not recoverable. Everybody wants that, that sunk cost to be included in the price. It's not. It should be ignored um, in, in decisions about future actions. Right, I, I bought the stock at three dollars and fifty cents. I, I got to get three fifty for it. Well, no, that's a bad idea. You, you know, it went the other way on you. Um, look at the macroeconomic situation. Is the whole market going down? What are you doing? Uh, don't don't get married to that three dollar and fifty cents number. You will die by that sword. Uh, you lose your concert tickets. The eighty bucks you already spent is irrelevant to the decision of whether you replace them. It's a sunk cost. It's gone. Uh, and that's that's it, and and that leads us to, of course, this. <laughs> we assume humans are mostly rational. The rational decision maker always chooses the available option that leads to the outcome he or she most uh, prefers. Now, this discussion of rationality is is a really interesting discussion, and and I could go on for another hour, but I want to get through this stack. Um, in the way. It, in the way of uh, the way I'm thinking, the um, rationality in the Austrian sense is that everyone is rational. Every decision is rational. It was rational in the 1700s to put leeches on people to get blood out of them. That was a rational decision. Um, you know, if we look over... <laughs> Medical methods back then, they seem completely irrational. So what is rationality? Now, we can have that philosophical discussion. But for, you know, for behavioral economics, um, they look at things in this, in this way. Uh, rational decision maker tries to get ahead, right? Are there limits to human rationality? Yeah, of course. Uh, I guess, you know, if, if you want to look at it in that way. Okay, and there's certain types of irrationality. Here's here's rational but human. Now they're trying to, to you know, they're coming around to the sort of the way Mises and, and some others, Murray Rothbard and some others, looked at rationality, which is kind of the same way I do. Um, fairness. Why would you take a worse payoff? Well, you want to be fair. Uh, bounded rationality, good enough, making a choice that is close to but not exactly the highest possible profit uh, may make sense because the effort of finding the best payoff is too costly, right? This is bounded rationality. Again, in Nudge, uh, they talk about that. And risk aversion. Uh, pe people will give up uh, being an entrepreneur. You know, we say, how, how do you... We, tr we try to teach this, you know, how to be an entrepreneur. And you can't teach it. There's no way you can teach it. It's because people are risk averse. When you say to them, "Hey, do you do you want to go work at the shoe factory or start a shoe company?" You know, no, I got I got kids and I and a and a mortgage. I I can't do this. You know, I I got to do what I'm doing.
and it's just risk aversion, you know. So um, these are human these are human ideas. We this is why when we get to the end of a, a stack of slides about uh, the Keynesian root, I've read Keynes. Uh, he 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 discards this idea. You know, he talks about humanity, but but he doesn't. He doesn't grasp the fact that every decision is deeply human. So, um, get going, kid. So, the irrational decision maker chooses an option that leaves him or her worse off. <laughs> now, <laughs> how do you know? You don't. You know, just, so the the the. the People like me come back and say, "No, they don't do that." Um, they, they, you know, they, 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 I, t I rationalize all of my decisions. I tell myself rational lies. I don't set out to screw myself, right? Uh, just the way I would, I would rationalize my drinking. You know, I mean, it's like every day you wake up and go, "Yeah, I'll probably be a bad idea, but to drink," and you know, by noontime you're drinking. Uh, why? Well, it wasn't irrational for me. I, I felt like it was, you don't understand, I, I, you know, I, I got to take the edge off here, whatever it is. But, but so this, this idea of, of irrationality um, and, and to break it down as an economist's view, uh, okay, if you want to think like an economist, yeah, uh, that might be a good idea. But um, n no one... I believe actually chooses something to be worse off. They don't. I, I've never looked at the world that way, uh, but maybe you do. Even the people that that you know uh, are interested in fairness, they, they're they're doing it to make themselves feel better, uh, you know, or they they love mankind, and that's that's a rational choice. But. Here's the decision-making mistakes, and, and this will finish up the stack. Um, misper misperceptions of opportunity. They don't understand all the costs. Uh, we can't make a rational choice, right? We don't. We're just. We just don't have enough uh, information. We're not looking at the whole picture. Uh, that, that's a biggie. Overconfidence. <laughs> Non-professional investors, you know, especially if they make money really quickly. Uh, they have significantly worse results than professional brokers, right? Because the market kicks everyone's ass, and and so you you, you know I I'm not overconfident. <laughs> you might think I am, but uh, I've, I've you know all we're trying to do is you know make more money more times than lose it. That's you know so that's a big one. Um, unrealistic expectations. This is what. <laughs> I mean, if you had to look at, at one common mistake in, in the 2008, in malinvestment, let's say, um, when the bankers came around and said, well, it was all those damn people that took out mortgages they couldn't pay. Well, did they do that? Was it irrational? And the Big Short has some people that, that took out loans that they shouldn't have taken. But... They were. They had unrealistic expectations about the future. They thought, "I'm going to get the promotion. I'm going to get the other job. We're going to we're going to work two jobs and pay for this house." Whatever they thought, they didn't think they were liars. They were optimistic about future behavior and level of discipline when they when they made out the loan application. So it's really hard to to just in a blanket way say oh, all these consumers were committing fraud well yes and no they believed that they could pay the loan now when they couldn't pay the loan then you had to you know in, in my way of thinking you had to say well you're still on the hook for the money you know that that's that's what uh, creates moral hazard is bailing people out including banks and corporations it's that <laughs> they make the same mistakes um, Counting dollars unequally. This one's a little more nuanced, but uh, it's really it's really a cool one. Find catch yourself doing this. The habit of mentally assigning dollars to different accounts, so that some dollars are worth more than others. Um, spending more with credit cards than cash. That's just why do you think there's all that debt out there? 
uh, credit card debt. Okay? So, would you replace them? I don't know. <laughs> Who's playing? You know, Rolling Stones? Yes. Uh, air Supply? No. You know, I don't know. It, it, it's, it's, uh, this is a, a question uh, uh, that's so subjective, it's absurd. Anyway, if you lost 80 bucks, you're still going to use for the tickets, would you still attend the concert? See, your answer was different. You're, di you're using different mental accounts. This is what Kenneman discovered with his partner. Um, and then loss aversion, uh, oversensitivity to loss that leads to unwilling, uh, unwillingness to recognize loss and moves on, move on. That's the, uh, gee, the market it didn't go the way you wanted to. Uh, take the loss and get out. My sister's doing this right now with a house that she owns. Uh, well, yeah, you know, I gotta get, I gotta get what I paid for it. And I'm like, no, you're not gonna get what you paid for it. It's not worth that. Uh, you paid too much. Um, out is out. Uh, status quo bias, tendency to avoid making a decision altogether, right? Um, <laughs> this is a great little example here. Uh, 86 percent in Sweden, four percent in Denmark, Sweden and Austria. The form contained an opt-out box in Germany and Denmark. You got to opt in. So opting out was <laughs> it was harder than opting in. That's a great place to stop. So anyway, there's a little uh, uh, introduction into behavioral economics. Do some reading. Um, you know, even if you if you're listening to book reviews and and getting a little bit more on this, uh, it, it's very interesting subject. If you're if you're interested in psychology. This is going to help you understand people and how they react to the world so that you can be a better employer. So, you know, if you haven't taken uh, psychology, uh, you should uh, in, in order. It, it, and, of course, this is economics, so it should be uh, laden with that. And, and so I, I hope you're, you're, you're able to do that and, and round out your education that way, even if you have to do it uh, um, outside of a, a credit course situation. So anyway, okay, I'm going to try and do one more tape tonight and I'm just going to keep laying them on you. All right.